Hello, welcome to another episode of Marriage in a Tightrope. I'm Alan. And I'm Katie. And, and we're still married. We are still married, and this is episode 90. We are novagenarians in the podcast world. Is that a word? It's the biggest word I've said in years. It's a word, yeah. It means it's a real you're in word. your 90s. Well, I know what the Latin roots mean. <laughs> I just thought maybe you were making, making it up. You know, Katie, can I just say that I still love doing these with you? I do too. It's great. And it's been a month since we've done one. We took a little break. We did take a break. Today, I feel like we have a lot to discuss and a lot to go over. So Buckle in. That's right. Buckle up. The first thing that we want to do is we asked in the Facebook group about people, like a casting call, um, to see if anyone would like to be interviewed. Ellen, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So... We we believe that there are other couples out there, such as yourselves that are listening, that ha- have a story to tell that is similar in some ways, but very unique in other ways. I think a lot of the helpfulness from telling other stories can come from just different phases you're in, different ways you handled situations. There may be situations that don't mirror mine and Katie's. And so that's why we love to interview other couples. So we're looking only, or excuse me, we're looking not only for single episode interviews, but the potential of uh, multiple interviews, starting with probably an interview with Katie and myself. But then if you want to produce your own interviews as well, uh, we would love to host those here on the on the podcast. So what we're going to do is if you are interested in being interviewed or producing episodes for Marriage on a Tightrope, we would love for you to send us an email stating that desire. And then in the show notes, you will see a Calendly link where Katie and I are going to make available some of the time slots that we have in our, we're not busy at all. So there's going to be lots of time slots available, right? Katie? Totally. Yeah. <laughs> we're, uh, we'll have a few slots per week where if uh, that time works for you, you can just sign up right there and then we'll reach out and we'll set up an interview and we'll do it over Zoom. It'll be great. Even if you're close to us, we can't do it in person because there's this whole pandemic going on in 2020 for those that are listening 10 years into the future. And in Utah, you can't see anyone until November 23rd. That's right. So we would love for any of you to just contact us if you want to email us, if you would like to uh, sign up online, that would be fantastic. We would love to get a variety of stories. And I think that it really does help our couples listen to what other people are going through. We are done with our workshop and yes. it, we just finished our third workshop and it was awesome as usual. It's a lot of fun. Not only with, of course, Natasha is always a pleasure and profound and funny all at the same time. And she's great. Um, if those, those of you who do not remember what we're talking about, we do a six week online workshop with Natasha Helfer and she's great. We've done our third session now just ended and we're going to be doing another session in the new year. Uh, details are to come on the next episode, which if we say it out loud, it means that it'll happen. That will be next week. It will be next week. Yes. We have a few things that have been now taken off our plate and we can focus back on to the podcast itself. So we are looking forward to that. And there'll be actually, I'm excited. Uh, we will announce a few different options we have that will look differently this year. And so be thinking of maybe, I mean, Christmas time is coming. This is a really good way to give a gift of therapy. <laughs> <laughs> a, a gift of good marriage. That's right. So Katie, for the topic today, I think a lot of people f- that find themselves new in the mixed faith marriage space are looking for a way to insert the topic of today's episode. It starts with an H and it's it- not hell. <laughs> well, healing is what we are all looking for in these super difficult moments in marriage, in situations, and it really does take on different meanings for different people. And so that's a topic we really wanted to talk about today is healing. You know, this last weekend, I went to Arizona. We had an awesome meetup. One of our uh, group members offered to host at her house. And women showed up 
and we all talked. Some women I knew, I made lots of new friends and, you know, we just talked about the struggles and asked questions to each other and shared our own stories. And I think that in itself for a lot of people is very healing, you know, he, listening to other people tell their story and realizing I am not alone in my feelings. I'm not alone in my thoughts. This is happening to more than just me. It's bigger than myself. So I, I think that that is a healing thing. Well, then I spent the weekend in Sedona with a group of women and I just, I want to just talk a little about this for a second. So about two years ago, uh, we went to uh, Mesa and I said, Hey, if anyone wants to show up, um, I would love for you to come and meet me for lunch. And these four women were the women that showed up and who took a chance to put themselves out there. And so we sat and talked for hours at this lunch and, you know, we really became close after that. We would text each other. We had a Marco Polo group and the five of us would continually talk and I'm not physically there in Arizona to, you know, meet them in person or anything, but they continue to meet, they continue to help each other so, through some really, really difficult things. Um, you know, they continue to help each other out. So we finally decided it's time that we all get together in person. We planned this trip for a while and we went to Sedona and stayed at an amazing place. And, you know... <laughs> The one thing that there was not lack of is conversation. I was going to say food. And food. <laughs> there was very good food. But the conversation, it was talking from sun up to way past sundown to, you know, one, two in the morning and then going to sleep and getting back up and doing it again. That's really late for being in your late 30s, by the way. <laughs> that's nothing for or you, for you youngins. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So... I think that anyone that's a parent is used to having sleepless it's, nights. It's 1030. I want to go to bed. Yeah. Anyway, so it was just soul filling, I would say, and healing, healing to connect and talk and talk and talk and talk. And women do that really well, right? No comment. Do men do that? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, yes, they can, and they should, actually. I think that's, you know, I laugh at first, but I think men should talk a lot more openly and deep like you are you are talking about than they should. I think that part of what we're going to get into with healing is is open and vulnerable communication, and that was a big part of my healing, and we won't get into it now. But, yeah, I think men need to talk more than they do. I don't know that they often will, and, of course, that's not a – you know, on a one by one, you got to assess each person individually. You likely talk with your friends about mixed faith marriage and all that stuff a lot more than I do with, with my friends at this point, but yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't just like mixed faith marriage that we talked about all weekend, right? right. I mean, we have a ama- like we have incredible stories from our past and, but that was a continual discussion. And, you know, one of the women that were with me, she's done some awesome work with a therapist and both on and, and on herself. And something that she shared that really just resonated with me and goes hand in hand with this topic of healing is, you know, every person that is in a relationship with a family member, with themselves, with their spouse, they need three things. Okay. So they need three things in order for them to feel good about their relationship, to feel heard in their relationship, to feel um, like they have a relationship. So I'm going to go through those three things. The first thing is safety. And I'm, I'm going to speak from a marriage point of view, since that's mainly what we're going to, I mean, what we're about, right? Is our marriage. So when you feel safe in a marriage, Alan, what does that look like for you? The first word that comes to mind is trust, that I, I feel like we can trust each other, that we feel that we can express how, what we f- feel, think, and believe without fear of judgment. I don't know that it means, you know, if I'm going to share something I know you don't agree with or believe in, 
I'm not under the pretense that it's not going to be difficult for you, but that you are open to experiencing that difficulty if I do want to share. Does that make sense? Okay. Did it? Was that convoluted? A little. So if I have something that I'm like, I really need to share this with Katie. I know that she doesn't agree, but like, it's important for me to feel safe in our relationship to be able to express these things. So I want to express it to her. I know it's going to be difficult for her to hear, but I know that she's open to embracing that difficulty because she wants to feel safe in our relationship as well. Sure. Yeah. I, I think that trust is a big one with the safety. If I, if I think that my husband is, uh, or if I find out that my husband is like out drinking with his friends and I don't even know that he drinks, that's a safety issue for me. I'm going to, all of these other feelings of trust and betrayal, they're going to come up. So I want, we both want to feel both physically safe and emotionally safe with each other. The second thing is connection. Okay. It's important to establish a connection with your spouse, whether that mo- that mainly I'm, I'm talking about an emotional connection. I hear you. I see you. I validate you. You are good enough, mm-hmm. right? Those types of sentiments and feelings. I'm going to say this, that this is one thing that Natasha says and that I love. Oneness does not mean sameness. So because you are acting as one, because you are a couple, you are a partnership, that does not mean that you are the same person, that you have the same ideas, that you do things the same way, because it does not work that way. And how boring would that be, right? Right. So oneness does not need sameness. Connection is necessary. And you mentioned emotional connection. I mean, one thing that we talk about with Natasha as well, and maybe we don't need to refer to her every single time. We should steal the credit. Maybe no, I'm just kidding. No is, you know, there are multiple ways to connect with someone, uh, especially in a marriage. And you can think of that as intimacy, emotional intimacy, physical intimacy, mm-hmm. intellectual intimacy, mm-hmm. spiritual intimacy, and spiritual doesn't mean religious, uh, but there is a spiritual intimacy within couples. So there's, there are multiple ways of connecting mm-hmm. and absolutely they're all important, right? Yeah. You have to connect emotionally, but if we, if we connected on three of those four, but we missed out on the physical connection, that would be a difficult relationship and it would be, it would feel difficult to connect. And I think that at different times in your marriage, you will feel like you are lacking in one or two of these areas. Okay. So those four, those physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual right now, many of you may be feeling, I do not have a spiritual connection to my spouse. Right. And for obvious reasons, I don't have an emotional connection. Therefore I do not want a physical connection. These things happen. Maybe there's an intellectual connection. Maybe the spiritual and intellectual are together. Don't feel like you have to have a perfect relationship in every single one of these categories. Cause it's just, it, you can improve, yeah. but there are times that you're not going to connect. But as long as you are working towards connection in one of those four areas, that's the connection. That's, right. that's, you know, you're making progress. So don't, don't worry if you feel like, Oh, I'm, I'm failing in, in, you know, a number of these categories. Well, take a step forward and make small steps towards that connection, whatever that those four areas may be. The last thing that a relationship needs. So the first was safety. Next was connection. So the third is the third thing is freedom. So again, this goes back to sameness. Oneness does not mean sameness in your marriage. A spouse needs to feel like they are free to make some own decisions. So what does that look like for you? So, I I mean, a random example that just came up uh, in my mind is our media choices, where you and I don't watch all of the same shows. There are, there is hardly any. (laughs) Yeah. If you're, if, if our media choices were a Venn diagram, our circles would barely overlap. That's right. That's right. <laughs> there are things that, that we both like to watch. And so we will, but there are things that I enjoy watching that you don't. Mm-hmm. And yes, I could talk about it from a content perspective and maybe I will. So there's, there are, there are things uh, in media that I will watch that I know you won't enjoy. 
a lot of F words, periodic violence, or, or even nudity may come up. And I, I feel that over time we've earned the trust where I'm watching what I want to watch and it doesn't feel like a threat to you. Yeah. And so like, I'm, I'm free to make those choices because I've earned that trust, um, that I'm not going to go and do anything stupid with the choices that I'm making here. Right now I'm, I'm going to put an asterisk next to freedom because freedom does not mean that you don't consider what your spouse's feelings are. Right. Freedom means that your spouse or you yourself feel like you are safe enough. You are connected enough to make a decision that is going to be good for you or your family. And, right. and, and again, there are asterisks under this and we're going to talk about those asterisks. Okay. So safety connection and freedom is, is would probably be the subheading under healing. Right. Okay. So under those, if you think about, you know, you needing these three things and where you need your healing, especially in this process, that healing is going to come in your marriage in your family relationships, in yourself. There's a lot of self-work. And perhaps in the relationship with the church. Okay? So with those, with that said, thinking of healing and those four categories, marriage, your family relationships, yourself, and your relationship with the church, do you feel safety, connection, or freedom in those categories? in those four areas. Yeah. I mean, I think that we would need to go down the list because I think that there are, you know, when I think about our marriage and again, not getting into heavy, heavy detail in each of those, when I think about our marriage, I definitely feel safe. I absolutely feel connection and I do feel freedom. I don't feel, I don't feel like we're restrictive of each other. We're very vocally. I I feel like we're very, we're both very vocally, um, considerate and encouraging of what the other person wants and needs. Okay. This is where the asterisk is going to come in. I'm going to put it right here. Sure. Boundaries. So part of healing (laughs) has been creating boundaries for both of us, right? Yeah. And let's talk about that for a second, because the way that I, when I hear the word boundaries, I, I think of, I think of like a negotiation that has taken place and in order for the trust to remain there, maybe trust has been broken and there needs to be a boundary put in place so that it's not broken again. And so it can be earned back. I'm not sure if that's how you would define a boundary. You could, you, that is absolutely a part of boundaries. Yes. Earning back, um, trust that can be someone's boundary. My boundary is, and this is just an example is I don't want, I don't want alcohol in the home. I don't want it sitting in my fridge where the kids can, my teenage boys can get to it. Right. That's a boundary I've created. Now I'm okay. If Alan gets a drink at dinner, I'm okay. If you know, it's a social thing and he, and he has something. I, I, my boundary though is not in my, not in my fridge. So does that feel threatening to you? Is that inhibiting my freedom? Perhaps. Uh, You're still free to choose. Some people may feel like that is pulling away their freedom. Sure. For me, it doesn't because I don't really care to have it in in the fridge. Uh, It's not really a big deal for me. So, for example, I wouldn't say that's a boundary for us Mm -hmm. because it's not something I'm pushing against anyway. But I, but also if you were in the future to push against that boundary, you well, know, that's, you that's know, where the boundary that be is, put. that's, that's, yeah. you know what, how I feel about it. Right. So along with this is things you do, right? We're talking about negotiating here. We negotiate a, a number of things in our marriage. And I would say that there are a few things I've said, this is my boundary. I, I won't, I won't participate in this or I won't do this. And Alan knows on my list, that is a high priority for me. Mm-hmm. And on his list, it might not even be a priority. For example, alcohol. This is my high priority. It's lesser on his. Yeah, it's not a big deal for me. So we can negotiate that, but he knows where my he knows how I yeah. feel about it, right? Mm-hmm. So I feel like 
setting healthy boundaries and specifically in negotiations when you decide together how you're going to handle things that's 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 a healthy way to heal right you the trust is there your spouse knows how you feel there's a boundary and what's the consequence <laughs> the consequence is if you if you decide to cross that boundary well you have the freedom to do that right but you may be breaking trust with your spouse. Yeah, you're going to sacrifice that safety and that you're connection gonna, exactly in in just to gain a little bit of freedom. Just to gain a little bit of freedom, and yeah. and I I don't want to use freedom as the that means I can do anything and everything mm-hmm. I want because yeah. that's not fair. Well, this is when this is actually similar, and <clears throat> I'll I'll try not to let it get political, but this is. This is one of the thoughts that I have when people say, I can say what I want. It's my First Amendment right. Well, yeah, you have the freedom of speech. You can say whatever you want, but there are consequences to what you say. Right. So if you say that there's a bomb on a plane, well, it's my, yeah, you can say that. No one's stopping you from saying it, but you're going to be tackled by an air marshal. (laughs) So there are consequences. So that's the way I look at freedom. It's like, I can Uh go and do what I want. Right. But it's going to affect our relationship, our connection, and our safety. Right. Uh, we, what we don't want here is we don't want one spouse who is uh, emotionally, verbally abusing their spouse into getting what they want. Right? Right. We're, we're, we're trying to s- steer clear from that. This is really where a lot of uh, counseling can be helpful. Yeah. If, if communication is difficult in the marriage... There is a fine line. I'm thinking about freedom specifically. There's a fine line between I want to be able to express myself and I'm turn, you know, I'm changing into someone new and I don't feel like my spouse is accepting of that. I want to have beer in the fridge. That is a normal thing for people to have. Why won't she let me or he let me have beer in the fridge? Like, where is that line between I, my freedoms are being taken away and I'm not... I'm not giving my my spouse the safety that he or she deserves. A lot of communication can help break down where that balancing point is, but counseling absolutely can help that as well. Yeah. Yep. It absolutely can. And so, you know, in your family relationships, that that also those boundaries. You can set boundaries with your parents, with your siblings. We have we've done so. And that's, that's a healthy way to heal, heal some of your relationships. And I think, you know, yourself. So there are boundaries for yourself. There are boundaries for your relationship with the church too. Yeah, right. yeah. Most, most people can't, they, they look at safety, connection, and freedom, especially maybe those who've stepped away. And they said, I don't feel those things with my relationship with the church. That's the reason why they've stepped away. Right. And that's one of the reasons why many cannot return. Yeah, that's a really good way of putting it. It looks different in every situation. There's there's the slow burn over 10 years where you continue to have a relationship there. No one really knows about it. And then you kind of fade away. There's what I did, which was my beliefs are very concrete now. I've changed my beliefs, but I still want to find a way to be involved and you try for a year to two years and it just doesn't work and you don't feel safe. You're not feeling that connection anymore. The messages aren't really providing anything for you and your freedoms feel restricted as well. So you just step away and other people, it's just overnight. It's for whatever reason, whether it's historical or nephew came out as gay or son came out as gay, or I have a transgender daughter or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. It's overnight. I'm done. And you, the the freedom and the safety and the connection is over. I'm out of here. So it can look very different in any any way, um, or in many different ways with your with your relationship with the church. Right, and I think that for some people, it is extremely healing to leave the church. It is healing for them to resign. It is healing for them to find something that does re- resonate with them, whether it be another church plenty of of our of our couples one spouse has found another church to go to right and things that have resonated with them things that they feel connected to okay so this is a journey uh and and can i just call out it's cool to hear you say uh you know it's it is it's very validating to hear 
the spouse that's still in and believing to say that it can be very healing for someone to step away from the church. Um, that means a lot to hear that because it, it just validates kind of you, you recognize that my participation in the church is different than -hmm. yours. Uh, I'm reminded of my interview with my brother, our interview with, with my brother who Mm -hmm. was a Bishop at the time. And now he's a member of the stake presidency, my goodness. But he, he said the same thing like there, he absolutely can see situations where it's better for the individual to step away. And that's, this has taken a lot of work on myself. For sure. Okay. So this is this healing that, that I'm talking about. I have done with myself to get to a place where I feel like I can say that to you in 120 seconds or less explain how you got there with your healing. And obviously I think we have 89 episodes behind us that kind of showcase that. But a lot of people that are listening right now, when they're just finding themselves in this, they're like, Oh my goodness, how in the world do I get there? That is a really good question. You know, I actually asked a couple of my friends to tell me why they are at peace or why healing has occurred with them um, in their own marriage and how did they get there. And I actually really love, because it resonated with me, a couple of things that they said. You know, one, one of them said that, you know, in the beginning, I've talked about this, when Alan said he was going to go research everything, I said to myself, okay. You know, what does that look like? And I felt total peace about it. 100%. I did not feel angry or upset or, or I didn't have sick feelings about it. I totally felt at peace. And so one friend said that they felt like they just needed to love their spouse and not to fix them. I think that's really powerful. That healing came when they loved them and not tried to fix them. It's okay to hope that there's change. It's okay to hope that your husband believes or or wife believes in Jesus again or God again. It's okay to hope it, but you don't you need to know that it doesn't need to, you don't need them to change, right? So I yeah, Alan, I hope that one day you do believe in God or Jesus Christ, but I don't need you to change who you are in order for me to feel healed. I can just still have that hope. And that would go the other way around as well, right? Absolutely. Like, I, of course, I would hope that we would be on the same page and you would leave the church. Yep. But I don't need that to happen. Right. And maybe hope is, is there a less strong word than hope? I don't even know. Um, maybe I just don't need them. You know, I mean. Hope is fine. We don't need yeah. to explore that. Yeah. It's, I, I completely see what or you're saying. Or thought patterns. You know, I mean, I think all of us have those thoughts. Well, you know, I, I like one day maybe he'll do this. And we do this to ourselves. All of us do. Right. All of us do on on both sides. Okay. Um, but you don't need it to happen. Uh, one thing also that another friend said is they didn't fight their spouse's journey and they sat down with their, their emotions. So we did an episode on this where I said, okay, this is how I cope. Everyone copes differently. There were two things that really caused me to, <laughs> to turn to one was trips because if I were gone, I didn't have to face it. So, and I could plan something that's not on my mind. I could have something to plan. Like, I can't even tell you. I mean, we, we took six trips to California in one year and that was beside the other trips we took. I mean, I was like constantly, that was sort of my coping mechanism was just to leave physically leave because when we our, we feel like um, our world is crumbling around us. We do those three things: those Just flight, go to a different world, those flight, a whole new world, if you will. Those those flight, freeze, fight, flight, or freeze. Yeah, fight, flight, or freeze. For me, it was I'm out of here. It was literal flight. It was a literal Get flight. On a plane <laughs> out of here. <laughs> but those are those those are some co- coping mechanisms. And then I had to sit down and sit with my feelings. And then I had to I had to feel mad. I had to feel confused. I had to feel um, sad, betrayal. And then eventually you don't want to stay in those feelings. You want to come out of those and you want to feel acceptance. You want to feel love again. And so it's really important that you don't skip a step. You don't 
skip ahead. For some of you, you can get through those missions, um, emotions quite quickly. For me, it was not quickly. So, uh, another thing is reframing the anger. So thinking about, well, who's to say they're not exactly where they should be. Sometimes it's hard to reframe that anger that, that you're feeling, but I do feel like Alan's a, a better person now than he was before. Aww. I think he's, I think he's more intentional about what he does with his actions towards other people, as well as with the children, which that doesn't look the same for me. Right. You know, I, I still want to pray with my kids. I want to take him to church, but maybe that means he's being intentional in some other way. So I, I, I do feel like good has come. And of course there are books, there are podcasts, um, there are lots of resources out there to help you, to help you, um, get through. And, you know, definitely along with all of these other things. Okay. So in this healing circle, you have uh, vulnerable, open communication has been key. And, you know, the podcast has been probably the way that we've been able to handle that. Well, that's not replicable for them, right? Sure. Start your own. Start your own, guys. You don't even have to release it. Just hit record and talk. (laughs) But when it was really, really difficult and we had to record an episode, we'd sit down and push record and we would do what we're doing now is have a conversation. That's not easy. It's not easy for you to do at home, not in front of a microphone, alone, with yourself, with your spouse, with your family members, with leaders who are being well-meaning, sometimes maybe intrusive. It's not easy to do to have that open communication. When I look at everything you just said, you know, you're talking from the perspective of a believing spouse who is trying to heal. When I hear that, I look at the list that you just read out and I think it is so similar to my list when I, as I was healing over the last few years, vulnerable communication really helped, helps me heal personally as well. Books and podcasts, audiobooks. Uh, you didn't mention music. Music was huge for me. I remember my, I called my emo stage where we were in a, we were at a cabin with your, with some of your family and there was a big hill and I was on that hill for the entire four days, just walking around this hill with the earbuds and in and just I may as well have had eyeshadow and long black hair because it was, <laughs> I was just a, I was, I don't know if that I was mopey, but I was very introspective and Lincoln Park was helping me through it and Avet Brothers, et cetera. Uh, you, you mentioned a, f- a few other things that, that were absolutely um, so, so vital for my own personal healing. So in those moments, if you can have that recognition that your spouse for different reasons, is experiencing very similar feelings. You can lean into your spouse and you can say those things like, I know what you're going through is hard. We're going through very similar emotions and I know how difficult that must be for you. I want to be there for you. And now you're healing your marriage because you're recognizing that individually you're going through very similar emotions. I personally feel that at the beginning, especially the one that is changing. So me in this situation needs to have a little bit more patience because while I didn't ask for this to happen, Katie truly is a innocent bystander. Like she, it's not happening to her and she did not ask for this. I didn't ask for it, but it is happening to me. So I try to remember that uh, and try to have a little bit more patience in the alcohol and the, in the fridge issues. And that's actually a bad example because I don't care. But in, in some of those issues that, that come up, I try to be a little more patient and that has helped with our healing as well. So you just touched on something that I think that also is super important to point out in order to heal, you need to develop your own emotional intelligence, right? So that is being aware of your spouse, aware of your relationship with the church, aware of your relationship with your family, aware of the relationship with yourself. 
When you develop emotional intelligence, you can look at things and say, you know, I, I see where you're coming from. I don't agree with you, but I appreciate that you're telling me this. That falls right under safety, connection, and freedom. You don't have to feel the same, but validating someone else's pain and then putting into words your, yourself what that feels like for you and using those terms for me, that is powerful. That's how you can get connection, right? That's, that's how you emotionally connect is that emotional intelligence that tells you, this is really good to say right now in this situation, or wow, if I say this, she'll slap me across my face. <laughs> right. There's a better right? way to say things and there's a time and place to say things. What well, as you're talking now, it's I know it's interesting for us on the podcast to discuss this because we are not only trying to teach others, but also we are living it at the same time. So lived experience versus versus, versus clinical experience, I guess you you could say. We don't mm-hmm. we're not educators professional educators. We're not professional educators. But we are, <laughs> we're amateur educators, I guess you could say. So I see what you just said, the, the need to develop your own personal um, emotional intimacy, or excuse me, emotional intelligence. intelligence. I see that in how you are handling Zara's baptism, where I, I honestly thinking back, and I, I've never, I haven't said this to you before in this situation. I can't recall a time that you were expressing how you felt about it. You've always in this, in Zara's baptism on this topic, you've always been asking what she wants and how she feels. And even Alan, this, this must be difficult for you. That shows incredible emotional intelligence. Now I, hopefully I'm doing the same thing and thinking of what this means to you I know you've been talking to family members as well and all these things, and that's really difficult. And so like, I, I, I look at this, this checklist and it, it feels very, okay, here's three points to, to, to heal over time. And, but I absolutely see it in action in, in you, Katie. And anyway, I appreciate that. You know, thank you for saying that. I think that it is a process. You guys, the biggest The biggest thing, indicator of healing is time. And could we have done this two years ago, one year ago, six months ago? Maybe piece by piece by piece. But today looks much different than it did three years ago when we started the podcast. My brother, and I'm just going to call him out because he's, he is awesome. He called me and said, Hey, can we go to lunch? And I said, yeah, I'd love to go to lunch. We went to lunch and my, this is my youngest brother and he is super intelligent. He's going to law school next fall and he's always been very in tune, I would say with those around him. Uh, And so he, you know, we, we got through some of the surface level things and he said, you know, Katie, I feel like the last couple of years have been really awkward. And, you know, when we talk, I feel like I feel awkward because I haven't known how to approach the subject. When you told me he was barely off his mission, he was going to school. I didn't see him a ton. And then he got married last year. And, you know, he said like, I want us to have a close relationship and I want you to be able to tell me anything. And I want to be able to heal our relationship. Okay, this is coming from a 25-year-old. And I was stunned. He says, you know, I know that you talk about this on your podcast. I know that you you talk about this with some of the other family members. But I'm the one that's made it awkward. I'm the one that feels like I haven't been able to talk to you about it. And now I finally feel like I can and I'm in a place where we can talk about it. And so... I would just love to tell me about what you've been through. And I, I said to him right there, you know, it takes a lot of emotional intelligence for you to come to me because you were the one feeling awkward about it. And I was fine 
having it be where it's at because I know that this is a hard subject for some people. And I just really, really appreciate you for putting an effort forward. Okay, this is three years, three years since we've we've said something. And you know, Time is a huge indicator. It it really does take time to get through some of this stuff. And, you know, Ellen and I, we we knew that feeling all the emotions we felt, we never wanted to stay stuck in one emotion, in betrayal or anger. You know, we, we wanted to get that place of acceptance and healing. And here we are. And I felt that one lunch with my brother created so much healing and peace for me and for him. And he said to me, you know, I just, I don't know what to do. I, I feel bad. I, I don't know if I should, if I could say a prayer or if I could, you know, do this or that. And I can see how awkward that would be for him to bring up to me. And so, you know, with, with all of this healing, um, time, communication, boundaries, you know, developing emotional intelligence, all of this has helped us to become where we are. And, you know, I, I spent the last night I was in, in Arizona, I spent with a former companion of mine and, and he, she actually mission was in the, the mission companion and she was um, in the MTC with both Alan and I. So she knows Alan really well as well. And she's been just one of those people that, you know, through time, we just pick up where we left off and we have stayed just really close friends throughout. I mean, 20, it's been what, 20 years. Um, well, not quite, I guess we're, we're not, we're, we're not that there. old, <laughs> but it's been a long time. And after we talked after some time of talking, she said to me, Katie, this is the most peaceful I've ever seen you. Now, I had just been away from my kids for, you know. <laughs> that didn't hurt. That didn't hurt and, you know, spent time connecting with friends. But she said, I, I just feel how peaceful you are. And I just feel like Alan is in such a good mental health space. And I said, yeah, we are. We are in a really good place right now. And this doesn't mean that down the road there isn't going to be hard things. This is not what I'm telling you. What I'm telling you is is, is it's it's incredible that other people can recognize that we're in a peaceful spot and that i think that speaks to all of the tools we've learned all of the hard work we've put in it has been hard and sometimes i've uh, there have been times where i thought there we're not this is not going to work out you've seen pictures of abraham lincoln at the beginning <laughs> of his term versus the end of his term they say like a president <laughs> especially wartime presidents age like 12 years for every one year or whatever. They do it with each president. Well, I feel like, I mean, I don't know if it's just the stage of life, but I'm going bald. My face is aged. Like the stress of the last few years has been really we've, high. We've really put on those COVID-19 pounds. Oh boy, have we ever, but it's been delicious. <laughs> it's been... I think we're reaching the Botox phase of our life. <laughs> Plastic surgery, here we come. That's our next stage of feeling. <laughs> oh, you guys. No. Um, but yeah, there there's been there's been a quite a bit. And I don't say this lightly, and I don't say it for those of you who are new to the podcast that are listening that are that think. And I know what you're thinking. We are never gonna get there. I, I know that feeling. I know the feeling of I do not see it. I am in the pits of despair and I'm not going to be able to pull myself out of this. And I'm, I'm here to just, hopefully this is encouraging. Hopefully this isn't a patronizing um, episode saying, Oh, look what we've done. You losers get your act together. <laughs> but I am super proud of the hard work we've put in. I am very proud of the steps that we've taken ourselves in order to get as close as we can um, and to feel finally feel some relief, finally feel peace. And I hope that this episode is enlightening for some of you. I hope you can ask yourself the question, am I feeling safety? Am I feeling connected? And am I feeling freedom? And then you're, you're, you're going through those that the other list, that subset of finding ways to feel and be healed in your marriage. 
This has been Marriage on a Tightrope. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Katie, yeah. thank you for spearheading this episode. You were awesome. Uh, I had a lot to get out, I guess, from <laughs> my girl strip. I just need to take more of those, right? Absolutely. If you would like to join other folks in the mixed faith marriage space, you can join our group on Facebook, Marriage on a Tightrope. We're also on Instagram, where Katie will be posting more regularly ish. Yes. Okay, cool. Yes. And then uh, you can email us, marriage and a tightrope at gmail.com. And don't forget, if you would like to join us on the air, you can look at the Calendly link in the show notes or email us. And lastly, we are going to give a shameless plug for our nephew, Blake. There's a little shame in it. There's a little it's, shame. It's in a it. shameful plug. It is a shame, <laughs> shameful plug. That's right. Uh, so our nephew, who is 13, has his own YouTube channel, and recently he did a mashup of two different songs that I love. Um, one is "Rise Up" by Andra Day, and the other one is "Don't Give Up on Me" by Andy Grammer. And Blake and his friend Liza do this and. We wouldn't be playing this unless he was that talented. And you guys, he is that talented. He really is. And it's very fitting into this topic of healing as well. He is. It's it's about healing. It's about marriage. And you can really put it to whatever you're going through right now. So hopefully you enjoy this song by our nephew, Blake Walker. We'll see you next week, everybody. You're broken down, so don't give up.